thank you, Todd. Well, I'm deeply honored by the invitation to participate in the Hannah Arendt Reiner Schumann Philosophy Symposium. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Chiara Botici, Simon Critchley, and Jacob Blumenfeld for bringing all of us together here and to acknowledge their common efforts in organizing this conference. Now, as the name of the event indicates, we are gathered here to honor two distinguished professors, philosophers and scholars who have made great contributions to the intellectual vitality and rigor of the new school. I hope that the following paper I present, which begins with an engagement with Arendt's thought, is understood as a contribution that takes inspiration from her legacy. Nonetheless, my paper will be rather un-Arentian, if not anti-Arentian, in spirit. A necessary transgression, I think, dictated by the timely demands of the anarchist term. As is well known, Hannah Arendt, in her deservedly famous book, The Human Condition, discusses how society has encroached upon the public sphere, how the social realm has spilled over into, and thereby largely extinguished, the political. Arendt laments the loss of the possibility of action, especially action in concert, which for her defines the autonomy of the political sphere due to the rise of mass society. She makes the claim that this development, rather than bring more equality to more members of a polity, in fact engulfs each of us and eliminates our possibility of freedom and the opportunities for new beginnings. The conquest of the public realm and she does use this military metaphor by the social, eliminates individuality, takes away the basis of a fierce agonism in which citizens strive for distinction from one another, and greatly circumscribes the possibilities of spontaneity and outstanding achievement. Instead of action, it promotes conformist behavior. Instead of equality, it promotes sameness. Instead of government, it promotes administration. In short, instead of politics, it promotes statistics. In other words, the rise of the social sphere, which by and large represents the routines of everyday life and ordinary concerns of mortal people, displaces the quest for human excellence or virtue that is characteristic of a politics defined by extraordinary deeds and words by which individuals seek recognition and immortality among their peers. Arendt's critique of the rise of the social sphere entails two further, more foundational and rather strict separations on which this critique depends. First and foremost is the analytical separation between aspects of life that human beings share with other living beings and aspects that are properly human or which define a human way of life. The bestial and the human, Zoe and Bios. This analytical distinction is then translated into a second one that has practical implications, one that is both spatial and behavioral, the private and the public. Each is a distinctive sphere that upholds the difference between these two ways of defining life. Both our bestial and our human forms of living translate into certain specific activities that constitute them. These activities, in turn, define and organize the ways in which individuals relate to one another and where these relations take place. The bestial element of humanity, which concerns all of the activities associated with the maintenance and reproduction of life, constitute the material confined to the private sphere, the sphere of the household and the family. The urgent, recurrent, cyclical necessities of life, such as subsistence, the maintenance and daily reproduction of labor power, and eventually biological reproduction, along with the continual fight against nature and natural processes of growth and decay, all of which activity Arendt designates with the name labor, belongs to the realm of the household. Labor, she argues, is merely repetitive and does not create or produce anything enduring. The products of labor vanish with or soon after the act of laboring itself. Labor adds little or nothing to the value of materials that it works upon. The activities of the household are merely for consumption. Modeled after giving birth, labor is painful and self-referential. Even though it creates life, it, quote, remains imprisoned within its own metabolism, end of quote. Although there may be 
and I'm quoting again, a certain happiness in painful exhaustion and pleasurable regeneration, Arendt argues, namely the happiness of being alive, this is not ultimately a specifically human form of happiness, but is shared with other living beings. The nature of the activities that constitute labor and the laws of nature and necessity that drive them also dictate the nature of the relations among members of a household, the space in which they should be confined. Even though this is called the private sphere, privacy is not the same as solitude. Taking care of basic needs requires coexistence, but social relations define this coexistence, that define this coexistence are unequal, dependent, and often violent, and therefore non-political. In fact, insofar as the needs and wants that characterize the activities in this sphere create the conditions of possibility for the participation of individuals in the human sphere proper, they are pre-political. It is only when we're able to free ourselves from these needs, which of course for the ancients that inspire Arendt's work meant dominating others who will take care of these needs for us, can we enter the realm of freedom. To enter the realm of freedom, one must also literally step out of the household and into the public sphere where each can be seen and heard by others. On the other hand, the properly human element of human life centered on speech and action, takes place outside the household and within the city, in what Arendt calls the common world of equals. The common world defined by the exclusion of our, quote, privately owned places within it, is the world of, quote, the human artifact, the fabrication of human hands, as well as the affairs which go on among those who inhabit the man-made world together, end of quote. It is important to recall that Arendt calls all of those activities which require skills, specialization, and cooperation, and which create, or rather fabricate, enduring objects for use, work. Work occupies an intermediate category that is most at home in the market, where products of work are exchanged, rather than in the household. Yet it still provides the enduring artifacts upon which our common world of freedom is built. The political realm, in her conception then, is free not only from necessity that defines the material conditions of existence and entraps us in our own bodies, but also from the inequality and domination that arises from the rulership appropriate to the relations among unequals in the household. These two spatially, socially, and analytically distinct realms are like night and day. They are different, yet complementary. The darkness of the night hides us from the gaze of others, and through futile yet necessary labor, prepares us for the work, action, and speech that give meaning to each new day. Finally, the three binaries that I've so far summarized between mere life and good life, between the private and the public, between the household and the polis, and the nature of the activities and social relations that define them as distinct life spheres also correspond to a strict normative hierarchy. And I quote, household life exists for the sake of the good life in the polis. Like the world of the ancient Greeks she exalts, Arendt has little other than contempt for the private sphere defined by labor. If labor is the life world of slavery in the ancient world, it becomes the life world of the poor masses in the modern world with whom the once immobile property that defined the spatial contours of the private is transformed into mobile property, now largely confined to self-ownership. With modernity and the participation of the masses into politics from which they were once excluded, their social station, their daily concerns, bread and butter issues are also politicized. What was once protected by a spatial and social separation determined by the walls of one's estate and the division of labor and relations of domination within it seep into the common world whose boundaries are now blurred. The consequence, according to Arendt, is that all human activities are progressively reduced to a common denominator, that of labor, 
and every activity gains value insofar as it is a means of procuring the necessities of life and providing for their abundance. What was once an arrangement dictated by our bestial life now becomes a pervasive attitude, a way of life, a mentality, one in which we can no longer hold and esteem as separate, even analytically, what is properly human from what is not. What was once the bestiality of man now becomes the expression of our humanity. We have forgotten how to live humanly, Arendt contends, because of our preoccupation with making a living. Now surely, I'm not the first to critique Arendt's model for politics, which she takes up as an ideal and idealized form for the organization of life, providing at once a blueprint for contemporary discourses on biopolitics and a normative scale on which to weigh its value vis-a-vis -vis politics proper, or an emancipatory politics that Arendt would herself subscribe to. Scholars who have commented on the human condition have rightly pointed out how disconcerting Arendt's denigration is for activities that she considers non-political, while simultaneously she glorifies the political sphere. They have drawn our attention to her elitism, her insistence on breaking up the continuum of human relations that blend social, political, economic, and biological aspects into one another. Her reification of these separations that can only be sustained by the enslavement of some for the leisure of others. Her inability to perceive that her search for an autonomy of the political is an expression of her own life experience with fascism and, dare I say, the class position that she assumes in politics. Indeed, she offers not only a highly romanticized reading of the politics of the ancients, as free of relations of arbitrariness and command, but also a nostalgic yearning for a time in which heroism and lofty principles animated the actions of select individuals. I will not rehearse these criticisms in further detail here. Instead, I propose to show that the separation between what Arendt calls the social and the political is not only unsustainable, and nor was that separation actually sustained in ancient Greece, as we shall shortly see, but that, in fact, we gain much by reckoning with the emancipatory possibilities inherent in the politicization of the world of necessity as a means to expand the sphere of freedom. It is time we give up the nostalgia for a politics that never existed, except perhaps, except perhaps in Pericles' funeral oration. It's time to let the dead bury the dead and focus on how the spheres of life that Arendt class considers non-political or not worthy of politics can be used to develop an autonomous political culture, autonomous, that is, from officially existing politics, which, and I assume Arendt would agree with us on this point, nowhere approaches a sphere of pre freedom that we cherish in common. I would like to begin tackling this task with Arendt, Indeed, by revisiting a striking, powerful, and beautiful metaphor she provides to discuss the public sphere. She argues, and I quote, to live together in the world means essentially that a world of things is between those who have it in common. As a table is located between those who sit around it, the world, like every in-between, relates and separates men at the same time. She likens the encroachment of the social into this blissful world to the sudden disappearance of the table. 